You're listening to the Unfree Parents Podcast, episode 020. Your scene to chat about parenting, life, and of course, Umfree's McGee. I'm your host, Sarah Jehemiak, successful event planner, first solo female podcast host in the jam music scene, mom of three, wife, and total Umfree. Are you prepared for what comes next? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for episode 20 of the Umfree Parents Podcast. I'm so grateful that you are here and spending your time listening to me talk about Umphreys. Um, If I sound like I'm shivering, it's because I am. It's currently 30 degrees in Buffalo, New York. Um, I record early in the morning before my kids get up to start their day. So it's really chilly right now. Um, I'm cuddled in my coat closet, which is actually where all of this is recorded, um, trying to keep warm. So if my voice sounds like I'm shivering and I'm cold, that's totally what's going on. (laughs) Um, If you did not catch last week's episode, episode 19, um, I chatted about a really killer show from October 16th, 2007 at the Toad's Place in Richmond, Virginia. There is a link for that in the show notes where you can check it out if you did not give that a listen. I highly suggest that, especially listening to the first set and the beginning of the second set um, at the end of that show. That show is just absolute fire. You're definitely going to want to check that out. Um, Before we dive into this week's episode, I have to mention the fresh batch of tour dates for 2019 that were announced on Monday, October 15th. So, so excited for 2019 tour dates. Um, This is part of the Wax On, Wax Off Tour. The dates so far announced for 2019 are January 11th and 12th in Richmond, Virginia, January 18th and 19th in Cincinnati, Ohio, January 25th and 26th in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, January 31st in New Haven, Connecticut, February 1st in Albany, New York, which is the one I will be hitting up. January or February 2nd in Portland, Maine, February 14th, 15th, and 16th in Brooklyn, New York, February 21st in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and February 22nd and 23rd in Detroit, Michigan. Tickets are on sale at the time of this episode's airing on October 23rd. There were uh, UMVIP packages available for four of these stops, but at this point, I'm not sure if they're gone, but I will put all of the information in the show notes so that you can get your ass in the van and see some umphreys in the cold ass months of 2019 and start your year off right. I am very excited to see, um, you know, multiple two-night runs in certain cities. Um, although I won't be hitting up any of those two-night runs, for me, it I feel that it makes traveling further for a show more worth it because there is two nights you're not driving or traveling super far for one show and then having to turn around and come back. You know, there's multiple nights in a, in a city, so you're able to catch more than one show, which for for me just seems uh, more financially feasible. Um, also, I'm sure for them and their families and crew and everything, it's much easier. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, yeah, I'm super excited to see how this multi, you know, night run in different cities translates and works out for them in the next year. All right, so in this episode, I will chat about the shows from October 11th to October 14th. Just an absolutely insane run of shows. Like, every single night was absolutely amazing. They're really making sure that these last shows of 2018 that they're playing absolutely just count. I think at the time of this episode's airing on October 23rd, there will only be holidays and the Atlanta run for New Year's Eve for 2018. Um, So definitely not very many opportunities for you to see Umphreys this year. So if you're wanting to catch a show, make sure you get your ass to Atlanta because unless you're going to holidays, um, you're pretty much shit out of luck for 2018. Um, there is seriously just so much 
from these shows for me to unpack and so much stellar stuff to listen to just absolutely insane um so i guess we're just gonna dive right into all of it um october 11th the band played at the fillmore in charlotte north carolina they have played at this venue a total of seven times with the last time being july 9th 2017 however they have played in charlotte north carolina 16 times the very first time being way back in february 28th 2002 um, Joel did mention on his Twitter, and this is, quote, exactly what he wrote on there. Unusual house rules last night contributed to our set list shaping. Curfew officially at 1130, but we had to start the encore by 1059 or the show was over. Thus, the slightly shorter sets and longer encore. Weird, but we made it work. And they totally did. Um, in no way did I feel like there was less music when I was listening to the show. I did notice that they were, you know, segueing into songs, you know, more quickly than they normally do. But that was obviously um, because of the time. I did want to say, though, um, before we really, really dive into everything, that there is so much that... Um, is really gone on in these four days. There's a lot of music that happened. And I'll tell you, I listened to each of these shows at least two times. And while I love to talk about every single song um, from, you know, each night of these, um, honestly, not only is that going to be super hard, but I'm sure you guys do not want to listen to me talk about all of this for, you know, two hours. So for the sake of time, um, for the episode and for you guys to not have to sit here and listen to this the entire day. Um, I'm just going to mention each song that was played and really just spend time on the stellar jams and the songs. I do want to mention before we really dive into everything about this show that at one point during, um, I've seen some videos and stuff. Um, Jake apparently broke a string and was playing with a drumstick. And then when he was waiting for his guitar to be fixed, he was just using his plug-in to keep adding to the jam that was going on. I watched the videos that people shared, and honestly, I thought it was pretty fucking badass, um, as you can imagine, um, but I could not tell exactly which part of the evening, which part of the jam that it was, um, so if you were there, um, please reach out to the show. All that information is found on the website, um, and let me know, because the pictures and the videos that I was seeing was, uh, was really, really awesome, honestly. Um, this show opens with October Rain, which has only opened a show 23 times, then right into Crucial Taunt, number five. Um, I love the jam odyssey that this one goes on, starting with Andy just ripping it a little after four minutes in, and then continues on this insane jam until 8.50 in, and then just rages so hard, and then Joel coming in and killing it and slowing it way down almost like a welcome relief after all of that and then they build it back up into the end of number five booth love with this very romantic beginning to it and a little funky jam inside then liberty echo the giant bust out last time played on july 17th 2016 at the stone pony in ashbury park new jersey 200 shows. Wow, that's just totally insane and absolutely worth the wait. I will admit that I had to look it up when they started playing this because I could not remember the name um, of this, but this is just wow. This has come back out, and now that we've gotten a taste of it, is it something that they'll continue to play, that they're going to dust off um, like they've done with Rock to Rocktopus this year, um, or is it something that we got it and we're not going to see it again? I guess we're just going to have to wait and see. Um, and Always Monster 1348, I Want to Be Your Lover by Prince with Kanika Moore from Doom Flamingo. 
this girl just seriously killed it. Her voice is just, I'm getting goosebumps talking about it. Just damn, girl, like, really. This cover has only been done four times total, the last one being actually early this year, January 28th, and only twice last year, so it's a very new cover for them. I will admit, um, I've not listened to any Doom Flamingo. I haven't um, dived into their music yet, but this girl is the singer, and I will definitely be checking it out now because she is damn amazing. Like, seriously, her voice is so good, and on this song, um, just spot on, perfect choice. Then into this amazing den to close the first set, I love everything about this song. The way it starts with Joel just playing piano, and then the way it builds up into this beautiful dance song, there's nothing more that I love than just being totally immersed in this song and dancing at a show. Just all of it just kind of swimming over you. I just love it so much. Pay the Snucka to open the second set with One Nation Under a Groove Tease by Funkadelic. I really love this jam that starts all funky about two and a half minutes in until four minutes with that tease coming in, and then it really gains momentum a little after eight minutes and goes running and then comes back to come back into the song. Then Triangle Tear, and then this wappy Sprayberry with a jam that sees Stasic getting funky as hell and goes on to this very demanding and almost kind of authoritarian path, trudging along and then going back into wappy. Love it. Then into Uncommon, first one of 2018, last one being played September 2nd, 2017 in St. Louis, Missouri. Stinkos, the longest song of this show, coming in at 1758. This jam starts right out of the gate, which is a term that, honestly, I've tried so hard not to use, and in 20 episodes, I think I've done a pretty damn good job at that, um, but this one is just honestly ready from the word go. It gets kind of dark a little after four minutes, and then goes on an entire musical journey, going into a really soaring, uplifting jam, just full of so much love and light. I love the romance behind this part of the song, and for me, it's like super encouraging in a way, kind of like, yeah, life can suck sometimes, but you're always going to be okay sort of a thing. I don't know. I'm a really visual person. So when I listen to Humphreys, I get a lot of imagery. Like I don't, I don't know, like if you're going to score a movie or, you know, draw pictures for a book, um, whenever I'm listening to Humphreys, that's kind of like, I get these different like scenarios you know, in my head based on like the way the music is. This one is just absolutely beautiful and 100% goosebumps listening to Jake play. Then they take it into the actual tune. And of course, who the hell can like help not just dancing and getting down? I just, I just love this song. (laughs) Then taking it into the actual tune and the lyrics, I mean, come on, those are amazing too. Puppet String, which will go unfinished here, certainly rages, and I really love the direction the jam builds up into the last two minutes of the song, from like nine minutes in and then on to the end. The dueling guitars, the intensity of the whole thing. Then it switches back into the end of Snucka, and Jake is just shredding so hard, and then they rage the shit out of this. Joel killing it at like the four minute mark and just the whole jam getting absolutely nasty, spacey and hard. Just some serious fuck yeah um freeze. Like really, I was in my house listening to this and honest to God even said fuck yeah. Like that's definitely happened. Um, Encore is Utopian, only about a minute and a half, and then into Fool in the Rain by Zeppelin. This cover has been done a total of 85 times, last time back in April 22nd of this year in Atlanta, Georgia. 
playing the whole song, not just part of it, um, which usually happens in a utopian sandwich, then back into a utopian, this eclectic musical adventure, and then going into the actual song a little over eight minutes in, and then going on to this amazing reggae path. The big conclusion of Puppet String to close out this amazing night in Charlotte. I will put where you can find the set list for the show and where you can listen to the show in the show notes so that you can check all of this out more. Okay, October 12th, 2018 at the Red Hat Amphitheater in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the third time that they have played at this venue, last time being August 11th, 2016, which would have been Bayless's birthday show. They have, however, played in Raleigh, North Carolina 14 times total, first time being April 4th, 2003. This show opens with Rocktopus, which features a snake juice tease in the intro. I know that Umfreaks Anonymous has been rallying for that one to come back, so maybe this is them testing the waters before they do that. Um, Rocktopus, which has been seeing a lot of play this second half of 2018, with its debut this year on June 30th at the Stone Pony. This is the first time that Rocktopus has opened a show. The last two minutes of the song feature Nether yet again. Um, the question is, is it going to come out, um, at the Palace shows, um, you know, coming up, or is it going to be coming out during the New Year's run in Atlanta? Um, it is a pretty beast of a song, so I'm sure that they want to make sure that it's totally ready to be unleashed on the world. I'm very excited for when it finally does, as I'm sure so many other people are as well. Then into the slow and sweet Xmas at wartime, which as soon as they started playing this, it made me think that it was a Stasic set list um, based on the fact that we start the show with this rage opener of Rocktopus and then into Xmas at wartime. Usually um, when you have a show that kind of goes in this quote unquote weird flow, it tends to be a Stasic um, set list. And recently when I've noticed when the the Xmas at wartime is placed kind of in an interesting spot, it tends to be a Stasic set list as well. Um, I don't have any confirmation on that. That's just my theory, and I'm sticking to it. Um, Mantis, I love the direction that this one goes on at about 635, and really all the way until they build it up to this kind of weird and spacey part, and then abandon Mantis and go right into Andy's last beer. Example one, then this Got Your Milk that, I mean, I just really love that song anyway, but the jam that starts about three minutes and 40 seconds in is absolutely 2018 Hall of Fame worthy for me. The journey that this one goes on, again, another moment that's just so Honestly, it's so hard for me to explain the feelings and where the jam is going. Just honestly, do yourself a favor and definitely listen to this one. And after they have the jam build way back up and then bring it back down to earth, they take that back into the beautiful end of Mantis and the always just fun and insane jam vehicle that is 40s theme featuring Bayless ripping it a little after six minutes in and just going on until about well over nine minutes and just leading this song into its huge conclusion to close out the first set. First set was definitely, definitely fire. Nothing too fancy to open the second set. Um, this will go unfinished for now and also features another really killer Bayless solo a little before seven minutes in and just this whole jam. But we already know what kind of jam monster that Nothing Too Fancy is. And Jay coming over to play keys, I'm going to assume that it's about 12 minutes or slightly after that based on what I'm, you know, hearing, um, then they take this and chug it with the jam, um, along to where I can hear slightly after 17 minutes, they begin to take this into maybe someday. You can hear, you know, little pieces of that song starting to grow in the end of that jam to go into that song. 
two by two, which breaks down to start this beautiful jam a little after seven minutes in, getting a little funky, almost 70s detective movie sounding. And I love the building up and the explosion into another Bayless solo, 11 minutes in, and then taking it down real slow and romantic, and then building back into two by two. Young Lust by Pink Floyd performed a total of 38 times as a full band, last time being August 19th, 2016 in Knoxville, Tennessee, 191 shows ago. Brendan and Jake recently have played this um, with Brain Damaged Eggman at Resonance Festival. I know I've mentioned it before, um, but I love it when they cover Floyd. It's a very good band for them to cover, um, and this one is no exception, especially the jam that starts about 3.40 in and just continues to go and takes this into a total dance party the last two minutes of the tune, just totally took this amazing cover and jammed it way out and made it their own. I added this one to my 2018 Hall of Fame list as well. Then right into the last minutes of Nothing Too Fancy. Ringo with a jam that starts out really funny, funky, excuse me. Love the entire way this jam goes in this over 17 minute version. Coming back into the song after only seven minutes and then going back into another insane jam for another seven minutes. And I feel at about the 14 minute mark that they definitely could have gone into a Beatles cover um, baby, you're a rich man specifically, but no, they did not. They continue to jam this out and build it back up and take it back into the ending of Ringo. Just absolutely insane. Um, encore Bad Friday featuring Wanna Be Starting Something teases. And I know a lot of people um do not like this song, but the jams that have come from this are amazing. This one starts to take off into a dance party with Joel's help a little after three minutes in, featuring the tease I mentioned, and then continuing to rage the end of the song until they go back into Bad Friday at 7:24. Just an awesome, dancey way to end this entire show. Um, I will put where you can listen to the show and where you can find the set list as well so you can check it all out more. You definitely are going to want to listen to that uh, Got Your Milk and the cover of Young Lust for sure. October 13th found the band playing at Pier 6 Pavilion in Baltimore, Maryland. They have played at this venue a total of six times, last time being May 19th, 2017. Also, they have played the city of Baltimore a total of 18 times, the first time being way back in 2002 on February 17th. This show opens with No Crying in Mexico. Love this intense opener to start the show. Attachments with this jam or stew, I guess people are calling it. I'm not totally sure. Um, it starts at like 6.50 in. Um, I think that them doing this has really made people like this song so much more, present company included. Um, I know I've talked about this before, my dislike of this song, um, but the first Attachments Jam, I believe um, it was August 18th of this year, most definitely changed my mind about this tune. They keep jamming attachments out like this. It will for sure be hard to pick a favorite one of the year. And I love how this song has grown and matured so much in just the three years of its life into this jam vehicle that we hear today. They take this dance party and slow it to an almost mystical place and then slide into Cemetery Walk. I will say there is nothing like the songs from the Mantis album. Honestly, for me, anytime I hear a song from that album, I'm almost instantly taken back to 2009 2010 just i just love that album so much <laughs> the jam here that starts five minutes in with joel and this beautiful but dramatic piano and then jay coming in to just rip it and take it all the way to the end to erupt it into the end of the song and then it just ends and i just love that i just i just love that song <laughs> 
And although people do like to um, hear them go right into Cemetery Walk 2 right after, I actually enjoy it when they play something else and then come back to Cemetery Walk 2, um, which is exactly what happened in this show. Whistle Kids, then Intentions Clear with a jam that starts to gain its legs a little after four minutes in and starts to gain momentum and life and gets all kinds of honky-tonk, almost dancing around the barn feel to it. Got almost a Sturgill Simpson sort of vibe. Um, And then they take it and drop the jam and switch it to go along a totally different path for the remainder of this jam. I did add this one to my 2018 Hall of Fame list mostly for the jam alone, and they slow it way down and move into Dear Lord that hasn't seen any play in 2018, last time being November 2nd, 2017 at the House of Blues in Cleveland, Ohio, which I was at. That was certainly an interesting night with my husband and brother-in-law. Some damn delicious tacos were eaten that night. If you go to the House of Blues in Cleveland, there is a killer taco place within walking distance of the venue. Definitely should check that out um, if you are ever in town. Um, Anyway, Dear Lord has only been played a total of 52 times and usually gets a couple plays throughout the year, but we shall see. This may be the only one that we get in 2018. Who knows? Taking the end of Dear Lord and getting whimsical and airy before going into Speak Up, the jam in this one taking off five minutes in and just going off, this one I added to my Hall of Fame list as well. Just honestly, just straight heat coming from that entire jam and bringing it back slowly into the end of the song. Here comes the Cemetery Walk 2 that I'm sure everyone was wishing for earlier in the set. We all know this is always a dance party, but this one goes down an almost dark path starting at 3.50 with this dirty kind of jam and then this serious just rocking jam for a little before six minutes on. Very dominating, almost like a let's fucking do this motivation coming from this jam at this point. 80s hardcore hairband music almost there too. Then just stacking this so high until it can't go anymore and then just burst out. And then at 7.30, it goes back into the beautiful dance party and rages on until everybody just absolutely dance their face off. It comes down with Joel just playing the end of this out. I love that so much, and it's just such a beautiful way to end a set. All in time to open the second set. Now, I was going to say that this entire second set is just straight fire. Every jam in these songs of this set are ridiculous. This jam that begins a little after four minutes in, and this monster that progressively grows larger, and I feel almost hungrier in a way as it goes on and then it switches to be a little less intense and tries its legs with a different way but instead decides to go back into that rock monster and Jake is just shredding to take it even deeper then Joel coming in just keeping this jam monster growing and morphing and then they switch it over entirely and take it right into hangover a definitely well-placed song after all that jam and all in time that just happened the one um this one excuse me this hangover is definitely not gentle by any means the jam in here too starting a little after three minutes in with chris hitting some high ass notes um before they go into it this jam does feature a tease of breathe by pink floyd then goes on an almost romantic path Joel just really tickling the ivory here, and then going back into the song. Hurt Bird Bath, dedicated to Bayless's friend who's at the show and said that he did not like Bad Friday, but they already played that. So, honestly, I would much rather get a Hurt Bird Bath than a Bad Friday. Um, But anyway, (laughs) Bayless does mention this being like a hometown show for him because he was born in Annapolis, Maryland, um, which I'm sure is not far. Maryland's not a very big state. Um, The jam in this one starts out really um, right away, only less less than three minutes in, and just takes right off until going into the part that I feel Joel is just honestly like channeling UFOs or something. (laughs) 
Jake's playing and the whole intensity that is coming from this jam at seven minutes in, it's very hard for me to describe. And I can only imagine, um, you know, being in the moment with this music. They creep back into the song and chugging along, certainly doing their part to keep everyone warm, as Bayless does mention it being cold a few times. In the Black and then the Lanier, the jam in that one, too, just about four minutes in, and then coming down to recollect itself and regain its legs. Going on a almost like a police-esque sort of jam, then starts to get a little bit of weirdness to it, and going on an interstellar journey, then really gaining some momentum and really just going full on. And then they almost gently set this jam on the floor to end it. Good Times, Bad Times by Led Zeppelin, which has recently been covered at Lockin on August 24th when they did the set with Jason Bonham. I did talk all about that set in episode 13, and I will link that in the show notes so you can check it out if you have not yet. This song has only been covered twice total, the lock and set being the first time that it was played. Chris is so good singing the second part of this song. I love this Zeppelin song, and I'm looking forward to them gaining more confidence with this and making it their own and playing it some more. Miami Virtue with an almost 80s video game feel to the opening, and then going back into then going into the Miami Virtue with a jam, starting its journey about five minute mark, really starting to gain the beastliness of this jam. That's quite a quite a word. <laughs> a little before seven minutes in, and then Andy and Chris at 8:40, just killing it and showing everybody all of the hard work that they do back there. I love it when they break that down and let uh, Chris and Andy have, you know, a little bit of the spotlight for a minute. So Chris and Andy, they build it way up to more and more and more and just gaining so much of this and then just splash it out into the end of All in Time to finish blowing the roof off the place to close out the second set. The end of All in Time, I think, is such a great way to close out a show. The sweet, romantic solo, the Bayless lyrics, then the build up into the conclusion, the lights, just all of it. A big, bold way to end this stellar show and a really stellar second set. The encore, the silent type with a little nice divisions intro fake out before. Bayless does kind of mention I had to do it. So maybe he's uh, kind of getting them back for <laughs> the fake out on his birthday. The silent type, which is my youngest favorite song, not really a favorite of mine, but I do love the jams that they've been playing in there. And again, it's another one I feel that they jammed the crap out of it to get people to change their minds about the tune. Um, I will put where you can find the set list for this show as well as well as where you can listen to this um, sh- in the show notes. The attention's clear, speak up, and all in time are definitely must listens. Okay, before we get to my Capitol Theater recap, I just did want to mention I am recording this part in my car. Um, so if you hear any weird sounds or anything, um, that's what it is because it is Saturday morning and I have three kids. So yeah, my house is not quiet at all. So (laughs) recording this part from my car. (laughs) Um, finally, this brings us to October 14th at the Capitol Theater. I'm going to admit that this run of shows, these four shows was a lot of music to go through. Um, Of course, I love listening to every second of it and dissecting it, but I listen to each show twice to really, you know, listen to jams, you know, listen back to different parts and everything. So these shows were (laughs) quite a bit of of time and and a lot of amazing, amazing music. Um, Anyway, they have played at the Capitol Theater um, a total of five times this past year two nights in 2017, one night in 2014, and one night in 2012. The Capitol Theater was built in 1926 and is owned and operated by concert promoter and guy behind a ton of amazing shit in the jam scene, Peter Shapiro. 
this show was streamed for free on YouTube. Um, hopefully you were able to catch it when it was on. And then I think it was still available at least the next day um, if you were not able to watch it live. I made it halfway through the second set before I fell asleep on the couch. Um, but that's usually what happens when I couch tour. <laughs> um, this show opens with The Floor, um, a big, dramatic, little lead-in to open the first set, and it's very full of authority song. Um, sort of a you-better-be-ready-to-get-this-started kind of way to open the show. Um, I'm not sure how often that's in the opening position, but it's usually seen at the end of the show or the end of a set. Um, I honestly like it being the opener. I think it's very good there. Um, I did want to shout out to whoever yelled, Chris, you are my tiger before Draconin. Maybe I said that right this time. Um, seriously, an A plus comment for whoever that was. That was, that was spot on and perfect, like perfectly timed too. So that was awesome. Um, the jam in that one starts to lift off about five minutes in and then starts to slow and chug along a little after 10 minutes to gain momentum and begin to get kind of dreamy and almost like pulling back the curtain and beginning to see sunlight, continuing with this jam to make it a little funky and then go back into this soaring uplifting jam and taking it into these beautiful nugget of lyrics that are hitting in this amazing jam adventure. I That's what I really love about that song is just this huge jam monster and then you know it slows down and just goes into these amazing lyrics i just love that so much um then comes the beast that is mulches i remember saturday night second set at summer camp i was right on the rail and they opened with mulches and i will never forget the energy that was coming from this stage like the heat and just just all of it. Like, I will never, ever forget that. And that's how I feel. Like, every time I hear that song now, like, I'm taken back to that, just the intensity. Um, the jam in this one gets really nasty after four minutes in and starts to begin on this reggae journey with Joel getting all interstellar, interstellar, galactic, and just weird seven minutes into it. And then it switches gears and starts to get a little heavier and then rages back into mulches. I just, that song, I've just really, really started to love. And a lot of that has to do from that summer camp set for sure. Um, the Pequod and You and You Alone, definitely um, both well-needed slower tunes after just the the insane rage from the beginning of the first set. Bridgeless, which will go unfinished and begin on its journey a little after six minutes in and mutates and continues to develop. And then at like almost 8.50 and they're like, nope, let's do this instead and switch gears. Joel with some organ action to start moving this jam a different way to really honestly just badass jam and then deciding to slow it down and gently move into Haji, which, of course, gives everyone the feels when they play this song. I can tell you that when I was in high school, they did this thing called the senior song. And, like, the senior class would vote on a song that kind of, I guess, like, represented, um, you know, like, the class or whatever. And it was always, like, some sappy, like, Sarah McLaughlin song or something. If I knew who Humphreys was and I was in high school, I would totally vote for Haji because I feel like that would be like the perfect, um, perfect kind of song. Jake shredding at the end of this and Bayless just belting out those lyrics. I just, it just goosebumps every time. And I know I'm not the, uh, not the only one that feels that way. Um, come together by the Beatles with Terini. And Ori, I was, like, practicing her name. I did not want to get it wrong. <laughs> From Southern Avenue. They've only played this song a total of two times. The last time being March 15th, 2007. So 1,240 shows ago. Which, that's just absolutely insane. 
Um, this song is featured, however, in the mashup Come Closer, which is Come Together and Closer by Nine Inch Nails, um, which the band has played a total of 25 times. This cover is really, really good with female vocals on it. I want to hear what Jen Hartswick is capable of doing with this. Um, but there's no doubt that Bayless could handle this on his own um, should they want to bring this out more often. Hopefully they do, because I don't want to wait another 11 years for that. The triple wide to start the second set off of the dance party, but not before a little Rhiannon by Fleetwood Mac tease from Jake. This one and roundabout every single time that he teases them. It gets me so excited. Like, is it going to happen? And I am sure not alone in this. But no, this one was just a tease. And honestly, I think that Jake likes doing that to us, <laughs> really. The odyssey in this one starts to take shape a little after four minutes in and continues on its merry way trudging along to grow and morph into this dance party and then and then it just keeps going on and although they say I'm not sure who they are never miss a Sunday show that would be proven correct here with the opening with this triple wide and then Jake just straight rock star shredding after eight minutes in and then deciding to lay the jam a different path. This one for sure added to my Hall of Fame list. And it just keeps running and raging. And Joel coming in and again giving this interstellar space vibe into the ending. And then going into seasons. A little deep outer space sound before going into that song. Plunger featuring Jake on keys, I think happening about six and a half minutes in, and then a sexy little Bayless solo taking flight about seven minutes in, and turning its sights on a different path with Joel leading the way with some almost ominous sounding keys and slowing it down and then taking it back into the second half of Plunger. What we could get, a song that... I know I've shared is one of my favorites from the new album, but I think that this one still needs some more plays to really become the song that I know that it's capable of. Um, but, you know, I know we'll hear it some more and it will absolutely, um, you know, grow and get even better. Um, I Ran by Flock of Seagulls, dedicated to Peter Shapiro. As I mentioned before, the owner and operator of the Capitol Theater, and also the guy who puts together a ton of stuff. Um, Lock and Festival um, is like one of the big things. Um, I know he owns maybe the Brooklyn Bowl. I'm pretty sure and I think that he is also the editor of Relics magazine um he had a big thing with wetlands preserve um I think is where he got his start which if you've never seen that documentary I highly highly suggest you watch that it's such a good documentary and it's so there's so much information about um, you know, this amazing venue and, you know, the history of all these different things. And it's really good. So if you've never um, seen that documentary, um, definitely check it out. I'll link that in the show notes, um, too, because it's it's really good. Anyway, <laughs> I Ran by Flock of Seagulls has been covered a total of 44 times as a full band. Last time played May 15th of this year in Seattle, Washington. Um, resolution with Norwegian Wood Tease and the jam, Joel really starting to lay it down six minutes in and just killing it for well over two minutes. Then him passing it off and filling it with soul and then going into LaGrange by ZZ Top. Only one verse was played, but honestly, my heart. <laughs> I have attachments to that song anyway because my dad loved ZZ Top and he is the reason that I love the music that I do and if he was still alive he would have absolutely loved 
raging Umphreys with me. Like, my parents, when they were divorced, I would go to his house and play records. I would play Wings records and Zeppelin records and Chicago records. And, you know, all that music was just so important to me. And, you know, growing up and liking the music that I like now, it makes sense. And I know that he would totally love it, too. So... Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so the last time this cover saw the light of day um, was March 13th, 2012 in St. Petersburg, Florida, 532 shows ago. And, you know, damn, this song is just meant to be covered by them, honestly. Jake especially. Ocean Billy, seven minutes on this beautiful, soaring, uplifting jam. And then there's that finger tapping that just absolutely gets me. I think of it as just like, you know, you're on a roller coaster and you're just going up to the top. You're like building yourself up and then you're teetering there for a minute and then you just go down and it's almost like you're flying and cruising right through the sky. And that's how I feel with this jam. And they took it to just soar right into a tease of Bittersweet Symphony by the verb. Verb, excuse me, that is so well placed here. It's just like the perfect thing to just have right there. And then they just absolutely instantly switches into this heavy, dank, and ominous ending to Ocean Billy to close out the second set. Wow. <laughs> Encore Kula last played June 30th of this year at the Stone Pony and has only been played a total of 35 times. I mean, you can tell from the way Jake is yelling that he loves playing this song, and I'm sure the other guys do too. But then the conclusion of Bridge List, and I can totally see it in my head when I hear this, so I know. You know what's happening, and I know a lot of you listening can see it too. But just the conclusion of Bridge List, the last two minutes in, about a minute and a half, Jake and Brendan just coming together, the whole dueling guitar thing, and I mean, come on, we all love it when they're playing off of each other. It's one of my favorite things. I've mentioned, you know, the chemistry before being something that I love about this band too, is just the chemistry between them on stage. But after listening to this show a couple of times, just this, you know, huge conclusion of Bridge List is absolutely a great way to end this show. And I do want to mention, too, on if you watch the webcast, you've noticed this, but I totally want to go to the Capitol Theater now. But the way the lights are on the you know, the wall and everything. It's just so beautiful. Like, that's definitely on my 2019 visit list because I just want to experience that venue as well. After listening to this show a couple of times, um, I believe this is a Bayless set. Um, again, I cannot confirm that. Um, I could totally be way off, too. But based on the Beatles cover and tease, um, the Verve, plunger and bridgeless that's why i'm coming to that conclusion um i will say that although all of these shows were fire from the entire weekend my favorite would have been the baltimore show on the 13th um i will put a link for where you can find the set list for this show and where you'll be able to give a listen to these shows as well in the show notes the triple wide for sure you're definitely going to want to check out. Before I end the show, I did want to mention a couple of things. First, there's now an Umfreak Parents podcast website. There's a link in the show notes where you can find everything. Your one-stop shop for all the episodes and show notes, and coming soon, a blog and merch. If you are interested in submitting some writing to the blog, all of the information on how you can reach out to me can be found on the website. I did want to give a huge shout out to Dave Levine for allowing me to use all of his photographs for the website. And the show is also now accepting advertisers. All of that information can also be found on the website. And if you totally love this show, I would greatly appreciate it if you would give the show a review because it helps other like-minded parents find the show. And be sure to subscribe as well so that you will never miss a new episode when they drop.